State University. Census Day is April 1. Now a House government reform subcommittee will take a look at the progress of the decennial so population the count. Florida Republican Dan Walmart, Miller chairs the hearing. Sit down and answer the questions and mail it back. America is counting on you. Today we again welcome the nonpartisan general accounting office before the subcommittee in the census. As I've mentioned previously, the GAO's mission is to help the Congress oversee federal programs and operations to assure accountability to the American people. GAO evaluators, auditors, lawyers, economists, public policy analysts, information technology specialists, and other multidisciplinary professionals seek to enhance the economy, efficiency, effectiveness, and credibility of the federal government both in fact and in the eyes of the American people. GAO accomplishes this mission through a variety of activities, including financial audits, program reviews, investigations, legal support, and policy program analyses. GAO is dedicated to good government through its commitment to the values of accountability, integrity, and reliability. Last week, the director of the Census Bureau was before the subcommittee and answered, the, answered and questioned the nonpartisan GAO and other oversight entities for what he termed real-time oversight that in his mind was not understandable. However, I would remind everyone that in the first major mailing of census materials to the general public, all 120 million pre-notification letters were misaddressed and the letter itself did not explain fully the purpose of the enclosed envelope to those who only spoke English, obviously a majority of the population. The director has termed both of these errors as major embarrassments. And, as Congressman Ryan, a member of the subcommittee, noted, the national 800 number was not printed on the forms. According to the Census Bureau, the 800 number was not available at the time the forms were printed. I must admit that I find this explanation <laughs> highly improbable. In the wake of these errors, a strong argument can be made for more oversight, not less. And these errors also call into question the ability of the Bureau to conduct the ACE, or estimation adjustment. Today, the GL will have its turn to defend its actions, all of which have been sanctioned by this subcommittee either jointly or independently. While Mrs. Maloney attacked our level of oversight and felt it may be intruding upon the Census Bureau's ability to conduct the census, many of the GL reports have been jointly requested with her support or that of Mr. Waxman, the ranking member of the full committee. I also find it ironic that while Mrs. Maloney criticized the level of oversight and called it intrusive and burdensome, in her next breath she asked the director to provide the subcommittee with yet another report this time on the level of oversight and the amount of time the Bureau takes to comply with various requests for information. The news reports in the wake of last week's hearing said, for the most part, that the spirit of bipartisanship had been broken. That is not entirely accurate. Both Mrs. Maloney and myself have tirelessly promoted the census and will continue to do so. However, I am not in the position to tirelessly defend the Bureau at all costs. When deserving of praise, the Bureau should receive it. But when deserving criticism, it should also receive it. Those of us who sit on this subcommittee in the Congress and the President are ultimately responsible for the census. The American people, and rightly so, hold the elected officials responsible for the actions of their government. This is the people's census, and we are the people's representatives. This subcommittee requests information because it believes that it is needed to make an informed judgment on the success of the 2000 census. On a regular basis, the subcommittee is questioned on the status of operations by members of Congress, constituents from around the nation, and the press. Let's say a reporter or local government official calls and asks, for example, how, in my opinion, hiring is proceeding. Imagine the shock if my answer was, well, the Census Bureau tells me everything is fine. That would not be the sign of a well-informed chairman or of a subcommittee doing its job. While well, the Bureau prefers to talk about the census in national terms, such as, quote, hiring is 4 percent ahead of schedule, end quote, that does not mean anything to a reporter or city official that calls from Dayton, Ohio, or San Antonio, Texas. They justifiably want to know how they are doing locally. The Bureau may want to reevaluate the level of information it receives and provides at the local level. It seems that the media is in need of this type of information. Of course, it's not, the Census Bureau, it's not that the Census Bureau cannot provide local information. Soon, every local government will have access to the mail response rates daily. It is hoped that this information will encourage local involvement and raise the 2,000 mail response rate, 5 percent above that of 1990. I believe that because hiring is such an integral part of the census, everyone should have access to this information. This information is not meant to embarrass the Census Bureau. To the contrary, contrary it is meant to spur action. As an example, is what Delaner Eleanor Holmes Norton has done right here in the nation's capital. After press reports on the hiring shortage here in D.C., she organized a job fair. 
That is a positive action by a local official who is made aware of a problem. This census has been a highly contentious one since the start of the decade. Both parties in Congress are examining it much closer than in previous decades. In fact, I would say the nation as a whole is taking a much closer look. But if the 2000 census is to be truly transparent, everyone should be able to see clearly through the window without obstruction. I'm pleased to report that the Census Bureau has been very responsive to my request for a meeting among the oversight parties and that this meeting will take place after the hearing today. I hope all the remaining issues will be resolved to everyone's satisfaction. I'm also pleased to report that since I raised the issue with Secretary Daley almost two weeks ago, GAO has reported significant progress in obtaining the information it feels it needs to conduct thorough oversight. Today we will hear testimony in a number of key areas. The Census Bureau had to reconfigure the data capture system in order to capture one and a half billion pages of data from 119 million households. I am very concerned that testing and development of this system has been behind from the start. I am also concerned that the new software and hardware has not been used in a simulated census environment. A key ingredient to the local census outreach efforts are the complete count committees. These committees are designed to do out local outreach and promotion. However, many of the complete count committees that we visited are frustrated, frustrated from a lack of resources. One such complete count committee in a major city told the subcommittee that they were shocked when they were contacted by the Census Bureau's partnership specialists, asked to supply materials for an upcoming event, and given a two-day deadline. Imagine the shock of the complete count committee. They, stood, they understood that it was the Census Bureau that's supposed to supply with materials, not the other way around. And of course, hiring remains a constant concern of the sub, this subcommittee, despite the director's assertion that, quote, I don't lose any sleep over it, end quote. I hope that my <laughs> concerns never bear fruit, and in fact, that the local census offices are all fully staffed for the non-response follow-up. Mr. Mim, thank you for coming before the subcommittee today, and I look forward to your testimony. And now, Ms. Maloney, I'd like to have an opening statement. Th th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Census day may be 18 days away, but the census has begun. Almost 100 million questionnaires are in the mail, and 22 million more are being delivered by hand in rural areas. I received mine yesterday, and I urge all Americans to fill out their questionnaires and mail it back. As has been the case in our recent hearings, the news on preparations for the census is good, a point which can easily be lost in the details of a hearing. But if we look at the forest and not the trees, things are going pretty well. Particularly noteworthy is a new USA Today CNN Gallup poll out just yesterday in which 96% of the respondents say they will mail back their questionnaires. I, I doubt it will be that high, but that is certainly an important indication of the all-important mail response rate, and it is very good news. Beyond that, and as the testimony today shows, things are on track. All 520 offices are open and running. Though, they, though there are localized problems, recruiting is actually ahead of schedule nationwide at about 75% of the total needed. The questionnaires, all 120 million, are printed and actually being delivered by U.S. Post Office and Census Bureau personnel, even as we speak. Director Pruitt has em emphasized unexpected problems could develop tomorrow, but as of today, things are running pretty well. Now, the chairman mentioned the, the problem in recruitment. I, I want to give the number to the public, 1-888-325-7733, as displayed here, for people to call if they want jobs and want to help the Census Bureau. At our hearing last week, the issue of appropriate access of oversight entities to Census 2000 activities and information was a major point of discussion. I do not want to belabor those issues, but I do want to clarify the record on a couple of points. First, the General Accounting Office and the Census Bureau were well on their way toward a reaching an agreement regarding GAO's access to Bureau information before our last hearing. If this fact had been clear to all concerned, I think much of the discussion we had, we had, we had would have been avoided. There was, no, there was not last week, nor is there today, a disagreement over access between the Bureau and GAO. I'll let Mr. Mim speak for himself, 
but I understand that all of these issues have been resolved. I also suspect that in a project of this size and scope and complexity, it is normal to have differences that need to be worked out and reviewed. Second, the guidelines on oversight which the Bureau has implemented were sent to the oversight bodies on December 16, 1999, almost three months ago. As best I can tell, they represent the continuation of policies which have been in place for over two years, and I'm somewhat surprised that they have become an issue this late in the process. If there was a problem with these guidelines, and they are only guidelines, it should have been addressed long ago. Mr. Chairman, you've raised concern about the access of our own staff and that of the Census Monitoring Board to field offices. While I would note that similar visits never happened during the 1990 census, they may have some value. But it's also important to understand that GAO and the IG staff are highly trained auditors and evaluators working under strict professional standards and their own guidelines on how to conduct themselves in the field. Although these agencies act in a strictly nonpartisan manner, I have real concerns regarding the conduct of the monitoring board staff, given their activities in the field to date, and the fact that they are not subject to any similar guidelines for their conduct. I know that the chairman mentioned his concern regarding the need for representatives of the regions or headquarters staff accompany subcommittee staff on their visits to local census offices. I just want to point out that this is far from unusual. The chairman and I both liken the census to a military operation, and I think that's a good analogy. I just want to point out that when members of Congress or their staffs go into the field to visit military installations, they are usually accompanied by half the Pentagon. So I do not think that it's unusual or inappropriate to have representatives accompany our own staffs. I know my staff has found the presence of regional staff helpful in understanding the census operations, since many times they can answer questions that the local staff cannot. I do, not, uh, I do want to compliment the chairman on his idea of getting all the principals together from the monitoring board, co-chairs Kenneth Blackwell and Gil Caselas, the GAO, Mr. Mim, and perhaps Mr. Walker, the Commerce IG, Mr. Frazier, and ourselves to personally resolve any issues that remain. As you know, that is exactly what Director Pruitt suggested in his letter of August 26 of the last year to you, in which he expressed his concerns regarding the demands of various oversight bodies and their impact on the Bureau's ability to conduct the census. I would like to put that letter in the record, and, and uh, if I could, if I could put both this le letter in and the one from February 8th. No objection. And that letter, February 8th, was directed to co-chairs Blackwell and Caselas asking for a meeting to ensure that their information requests were met. These hardly seem like the actions of someone trying to, quote, hide something, end quote. Even if these issues are settled at the staff level, I think a meeting of the principals could be very useful for all concerned, and personally am ready to attend such a meeting. Mr. Chairman, while we are reviewing the issue of oversight, I want to pose a question. What are the oversight goals of this committee with respect to the census? Oversight to what end? Are we trying to make this census better, to develop plans for the next census in 2010? If we're trying to make sure that this census is the best it can be, then why hasn't the subcommittee responded to the major recommendations GAO had in their December report? The GOA gave us some concrete statutory steps to improve the pool of possible enumerators, which you have pointed out is still a concern in some small pockets around the country. I know that you strongly supported Mrs. Meek's bill, H.R. 683, which would have allowed current welfare recipients to receive their benefits and work for the census at the same time, but the majority leader has refused to bring it to a vote on the floor. I also know that recruitment is still a concern in the LCOs in both our districts. I think responding to the GAO's suggestions incorporated in my bill, H.R. 3581, would make sense. If this subcommittee is committed to constructive oversight, we should act on those recommendations. Of course, the alternative to constructive oversight is to use it to play gotcha with the census in a continuing effort to try to stop the use 
of modern statistical methods. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mim, Mim uh, if you'd stand, I believe uh, Mr. Uh, Height and Mr. Golden uh, and uh, raise your right hand and refer you all three in, please. Uh, do you solemnly swear the, te the testimony you're about to give before the subcommittee with the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Let the uh, record acknowledge that they answered in the affirmative. And, Mr. Mim, you have an opening statement. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mrs. Maloney. It's uh, once again a great honor and a pleasure to appear before you today to discuss the status of the 2000 census. As you know, March is one of the most crucial periods in the 10-year census cycle. Over the course of this month, the Bureau will deliver census questionnaires to the vast majority of the nation's 120 million households. I also received my questionnaire yesterday. Knowing I would appear before you today, I made sure I filled it out and mailed it in today. So I, um, I would have mailed it in in any case, but wanted to get it in today. The Bureau will begin to process millions of completed questionnaires at its four data capture centers located across the country this month. Outreach and promotion efforts will be at their greatest intensity. The Bureau's temporary workforce will, peak to, will approach peak levels, and coverage improvement programs are to get underway. I am fortunate to be joined today by two of my colleagues who have managed GAO's work on the 2000 Census. Randy Height leads GAO's work on a wide range of federal technology issues, including the Census, and Robert Goldenkoff has day-to-day -day responsibility for much of our work on Census operations. Our statement focuses on developments that have occurred since we last testified before the subcommittee in February regarding such essential activities as, first, the outreach and promotion program, second, field follow-up operations, including staffing and coverage improvement, and third, data capture. In addition, I will discuss the steps the Bureau has taken to ensure that the census questionnaires do not contain the same misprint as was in the mailing addresses that was in the notification letters. However, before turning to those issues, I want to spend just a moment on the question of GAO's access to census, operation, to census operational information. Um, Mr. Chairman, as you and, and Mrs. Maloney, as you mentioned in your opening statements, in recent days we have reached agreement with the Bureau and implemented a process that I am confident will allow us to fulfill our role in supporting the bipartisan oversight needs of this subcommittee. This agreement with the Bureau provides us with access to the routine management information on the status of the census, while importantly minimizing the burden on the Bureau. It's, in other words, a new process that they established to make sure that it reduces the, the burden from the other process that they had been using. In reaching this agreement, I want to thank the Bureau for its cooperation and willingness to work with us on access issues, the subcommittee and its efforts, and in particular you, Mr. Chairman, for the attention and support that you gave us during this time. I, I deeply appreciate your efforts on our behalf in this, on this issue. Turning now to the Census Outreach and Promotion Program, the Bureau has formed partnerships with organizations across the country to help promote the Census. The Complete Count Committees, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, are a key component of the Bureau's partnership program. These committees consist of local government, religious, media, and other community leaders. Not surprisingly, in our conversations with m members of these committees across the country, we are finding various and significant differences regarding the resources that they have available to promote the Census and their level of activity. Regarding the support the Bureau is providing these committees, the situation appears to be equally mixed. On the one hand, committee representatives we contacted were generally pleased with the assistance and guidance they were receiving from the Bureau's partnership staff. The local committee representatives were also satisfied with the quality and quantity of the English language material that they received from the Bureau. On the other hand, however, several committee representatives we spoke with said the amount of foreign language materials, especially Spanish and in Asian languages, were insufficient to meet their needs. In addition to the complete count committees, the Bureau's Census and Schools program is intended to increase response rates by encouraging students to remind their parents or guardians to respond to the Census. The complete count committee and local Census office representatives we spoke to spoke very high, uh, highly favorably of the idea of promoting the Census through the, the schools. Mr. Chairman, I know that you said you've had very positive experiences at, at home in that regard. To date, the Bureau has fulfilled orders for about 1.5 million teacher kits for elementary, middle, and high school teachers. However, problems have occurred in distribution of these materials. Orders for census in the school materials are taking between two and four weeks to be filled, according to the Bureau officials responsible for the day-to-day -day management of this program. 
An effective publicity and outreach program is important to boost mail response rates, which contributes to higher census data quality and reduces the staff needs and schedule burdens on the census. This leads to the second topic I'd like to cover this afternoon, census field operations. The Bureau's update leave operation, which began on March 3rd, was the first test of the Bureau's ability to staff its operations at near peak activities. Over 70,000 enumerator and other staff are now in the field conducting update leave. However, to meet its non-response follow-up staffing needs, the much larger operation that's coming in just a few weeks, the Bureau needs to recruit an additional 700,000 qualified applicants to meet its overall goal of 2.4 million qualified applicants by mid-April. Bureau data show that nationally, as of March 2nd, the Bureau had recruited 74 percent of the applicants that it needed. This was slightly ahead of the Bureau's national 71 percent goal at that point. However, seven of the Bureau's 12 regional offices fell short of the 71 percent benchmark. Table 1 in my written statement shows the progress the Census regions have made in meeting recruiting goals in February and in March. Most important, at the local level, 270 of the Bureau's 511 local census offices fell below the Bureau benchmark of 71 percent. Of these 270, 22 had recruited fewer than half of the qualified applicants that the Bureau estimated it needed as of March 2nd. The regional and local census officials continue to aggressively recruit the applicants. For example, the Census Bureau is working with communities to set up testing at community events. They're meeting with local leaders. Um, the Atlanta and several other regional offices are mailing postcards to targeted zip codes where they have, that have been identified as hard to recruit areas. And in some cases, uh, they have increased pay rates for enumerators and other staff. In addition to the follow-up follow efforts or efforts to follow up on non-response, non-responding households, the Bureau has included coverage improvement programs in the 2000 census that are aimed at increasing the count of the hard to enumerate populations. Two of these programs that we've been most closely monitoring are the Bureau's walk-in questionnaire assistance centers and the Be Counted program. Bureau data as of March 1 show that a combined total of 46,000 be counted sites and questionnaire assistance centers have been committed to be established. For perspective, this is about three and a half times the 12,600 McDonald's restaurants that are, that are uh, in the nation. Uh, being the father of small <coughs> children, I'm well acquainted, I think, with about half of those McDonald's restaurants. As we discussed in our February report to the subcommittee, the Bureau appears to be taking the steps needed to ensure that uh, a, a successful be counted in questionnaire assistance cent center effort. They learned some key lessons from the dress rehearsal and are taking appropriate actions. Turning to the third topic I will discuss today, census data capture. As of today, the Bureau reports that it has implemented the near-term system changes and completed all scheduled test events, including an operational test at each data capture, data capture center and a test of the four centers operating concurrently. Further, as of today, the data capture centers are operating, have been operating for about a week, the first two days of which they checked in an average of about of over 117,000 questionnaires. This workload represents about 8 percent of the daily workload expected later this month when peak operations kick in, where they'll be processing about 1.5 million questionnaires per day. Thus, the actual operations and the data we have thus far demonstrate that, the, demonstrate that the centers are up and running, but they do not yet demonstrate those centers' readiness to operate at expected production level workloads. Moreover, the information that we have seen on actual operations does not address whether recent changes to the data capture system are functioning correctly. We therefore remain uncertain about the center's readiness to meet the full production workload anticipated to begin in about two weeks. Our prepared statement details uncertainty about the results of the Jeffersonville operational test, recent software changes, the Bureau's foresight operational test in, in late February, and other ongoing changes. In the interest of brevity, I'll highlight the, the software changes and the, and the foresight operational test. As you know, Mr. Chairman and Mrs. Maloney, the Bureau has decided to adopt a two-pass approach to its data capture operations. To implement this two-pass data capture solution, two sets of software changes or releases were required. The first release, designed to support the first pass, that is when they'll get the 100 percent data that will be used for apportionment purposes, was completed in early February. This work involved modifying software to write, a, write the long form to a storage unit rather than presenting it to keyers for, for immediate action. This release was in place for the final foresight operational test.
While Bureau officials have stated that the changes were successfully implemented, the Bureau has not yet provided us with the procedures tested, used for testing those changes and the results. As a result, we do not have the information needed to know with any certainty whether these software changes are performing as intended. The second issue dealing with the, uh, the foresight operational test. To help prepare for the actual data capture operations during the census, the Bureau and its contractors conducted a final operational test from February 22nd to the 25th. The test was important because it involved production level workloads at all four data capture centers, as well as centralized operations and head Bureau headquarters simultaneously. However, the test was limited in that it did not include all, all the uh, data capture centers operations, such as the center's ability to sort, check in, and prepare questionnaires for processing. Also, most of the questionnaires used in the test had machine printed rather than handwritten responses with the same answers on each questionnaire, which would, of course, simplify and keen demand. Our overall point, therefore, is that some data capture operations have not been verified with production level workload at all DCCs. Specifically, near the, neither the Baltimore nor per, uh, Pomona Center have successfully conducted <coughs> operational tests of their ability to support a production load for sorting or documentation. Finally, let me comment very briefly on the addresses, uh, address list problem in the notification levels le Take letter. Your time. I, we oh, thank you. Thank you. Since this problem was discovered by the Postal Service last month, we've been examining the Bureau's checks to make sure that the problem was not repeated on census questionnaires. Once they learned of the error, the Bureau officials said that, they, that both the Bureau and its contractors checked a sample of each of six types of questionnaires with the pre-printed addresses to ensure that they did not contain the same misprint that was on the notification letters. No such errors were found by the Bureau. My written statement details the types of checks that the Bureau went through. In addition, we independently reviewed a very small sample of questionnaires. We went to post offices, but certainly didn't want to interfere with any of the mail deliveries, so it was a rather small sample, at four post offices in Northern Virginia and found that they did not contain any of the same misprint as, as the advance letters. In short, it appears the Bureau is well justified in its confidence that the address letter error in the notification letter is not present in the census questionnaires. In summary, Mr. Chairman and Mrs. Maloney, let me echo a, a statement that both of you made uh, far better in your opening statements about the importance of public cooperation with the census. With the census day just over two weeks away and the census questionnaires out, already out in the mail, the, uh, one of the themes that we have been highlighting throughout the decade has been the importance of public cooperation with the census. The mail response rate, the ultimate measure of that cooperation, will be central to determining the overall accuracy and cost of the census. The response rate will therefore provide the first indication of the success of the 2000 census. A high mail response rate will reduce the Bureau's follow-up workload and accordingly, accordingly relieve some of the staffing and schedule pressures the Bureau confronts. On behalf of the subcommittee, we look forward to continuing to track these and other census operations for you and will be available to report at any point. Mr. Chairman, this concludes our, my statement. My colleagues and I would be pleased to answer any questions you may have. Uh, thank you uh, once again for being here today and giving us a chance to uh, uh, discuss the status of the uh, upcoming decennial census. Um, you know, oversight is a very critical uh, responsibility of Congress. Um, and there are four uh, different agencies of the government involved in it, the General Accounting Office, the Inspector General of the, uh, of the Commerce Department itself, and from Congress, our staffs, and the Monitoring Board, which was created by, uh, by Congress and the President uh, back in, I think, 97. Uh, Seven billion dollars of taxpayers' money involved. It's a constitutionally mandated requirement. Seven billion dollars would be spent on this census. So we have a responsibility to make sure the money is spent wisely and that we get the best job possible. And, uh, and that's what we're all concerned about. We all share that. And so we appreciate your being here. I'm delighted there is going to be a meeting this afternoon to try to make sure that everybody is going to be comfortable, that they have access, because this has to be a transparent census. If there's not trust in the census, we, you know, it threatens a whole system of, of government, in my opinion. Uh, and thank you again for explaining why, hopefully, everybody should complete their form, because it does save the government money. The more people respond by mail, the less costly it is to follow up. Otherwise, you have to send people knocking at the doors. But it's critical to every community, whether it's my hometown of Braden, Florida, I mean, for what money flows to that city from Washington or from uh, Tallahassee, it's based on census data. So our own individual communities, whether it's education money or transportation money or health care dollars, uh, it's based on census data or influenced by it. And so we need to, you know, do it. Uh, and so I encourage everyone that might be watching or listening to, to complete those forms. Um, the first major mailing of the 2000 census was almost a failure. Uh, we're getting calls from people who are confused about the pre-notification mailing. 
the letters were misaddressed, and there were no directions in English about what to do with the envelope. Also, the national 800 number was not included in the mailing. Uh, Director Pruitt called the first two problems an embarrassment for the Bureau. Uh, let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, you know, once again, what is your level of confidence that this problem won't occur again? And did the Bureau use focus groups to evaluate the particulars of that letter as far as the 800 number and the lack of explaining in English what it was all about? Um, and what grade would you give the Bureau for its attention to detail and quality control at this stage? <laughs> Um, it, as I, if I heard them correctly, there are at, at, at least three questions in there. Let me deal first with the, the issue of um, the, the focus groups and then the level of confidence that we have in other and then, and then get back to the, the grading. Um, dealing first with the, the, the question of the, the focus groups, it's, it's our understanding, and we'll be happy to do more work on this if, if you're interested, that there were not focus groups that were involved in this. The second mailing came, or this, the decisions to combine the notification and the, the notice that there was availability of a uh, non-English language questionnaire came rather late in the census process. It was actually after the dress rehearsal, and so there was not extensive testing of this throughout the decade. I think one of the lessons that, that comes out of this, and certainly a lesson that we have been um, urging throughout the decade, is that you, when you're doing the census, you don't want to be using untested procedures. You want to make sure that you, that's why we have census tests, that's why we have a dress rehearsal, to make sure that we can nail all those down and only do the, the smallest uh, fine-tuned as, as things go on into the actual census. And so, um, you know, I was uh, attended your hearing last week, and I, I heard, too, the, the director say that uh, he, he was embarrassed and how unfortunate it was that these crept in. For us, the lesson is the importance of testing what you're going to be doing before you actually you go into the, the, the field with these. Now, in terms of the, the level of confidence that they, um, they should have in, in other census mailings, dealing specifically with the questionnaires, um, the Bureau checked six different types of questionnaires. I mean, this was after they, they discovered this problem with the notification letters, went back, checked six, six different types of questionnaires, so they're basically short forms and long forms, um, and did not find a, the problem in any of these questionnaires, given that it appears that the problem with the notification level was a systematic error, that is a programming error that occurred in all 120 million. It's, they, they didn't have to do randomized samples. You just have to do enough to, to make sure that it didn't uh, um, occur in any cases. Um, and we, in our independent checks, uh, didn't find any problems in this, and so it appears to us that the Bureau is, is well justified in, in its confidence that this hasn't crept into the, the census questionnaires. Now, in terms of the, uh, your third question on the grade, clearly there is a, a, a need for when, when all is said and done and, when, and the census is over, and we're going to be at the request of this subcommittee and others looking at lessons learned from the, 19th, or from the 2000 census, I'm sorry, to, to think about um, the quality control procedures, how they are constructed, what sort of things that the, the Bureau looks at. Um, I think at this point it is, it is you know, probably an incomplete on the grade of the quality control standards, uh, um, but that's the type of thing that, that we need to and, and we will on your behalf be vigilant uh, towards as, as the census moves forward. Let me clarify something on the, uh, I agree about the testing, but you should pre-test that before you do it. In the pre-test, both in Sacramento and in Columbia, um, they did the second questionnaire. Yes, and I think in your report, I mean, we passed in this committee and uh, did not go to the floor of the House that we think they should have had a second questionnaire. It really raised response rates 7.5 to 15 percent. But a decision was made prior to Director Pruitt's uh, tenure there at the uh, Bureau. But um, uh, the question is, did they ever just pre-test the pre-notification letter by itself, or was it only the, uh, at least at the test sites? That's, that's something I'm not sure of. I'll, I'll have to get you that, that information for the, the record. Um, Robert, do you know off, offhand? We'll have, to, we'll have to check on that, sir. I mean, it, it did happen. The decision to combine the notification letter and the uh, availability, the notification that there would be a, a non-English language form available, did come um, coincident with the decision not to do a, a, a second mailing of the questionnaire. Well, why did they decide not to, in your opinion, the well, second questionnaire? I mean, I know you reported on this, but would you? There's, there's a number of reasons, according to the Bureau, um, the, the one is that they, they say they got an awful lot of second questionnaires that were duplicates and that it really overburdened their, the ability of their system to sort out and to, to check those duplicates. Um, I know the Bureau was very influenced by a number of press articles that showed up in, in South Carolina in which uh, um, people were quoted as complaining that, you know, I had just sent the, my form in or I had gotten my form and right <coughs> away they come back and, and hit me with another form. This is something that, that I think really is 
it uh, you know is is going to bear some scrutiny from us as an option that needs to be seriously examined for the 2010 census since we're not doing it this time around it, it's hard to imagine that a publicity and outreach campaign could not have been developed that would have said to said to people if you've gotten the first form and you've mailed it back in don't mail back the second I mean we all subscribe to magazines which is you know all the time if your subscriptions crossed in the mail please throw this away um, so it's uh, I know it was a both the, the policy aspect as well as some technical aspects that caused them to, to be cautious on this. Uh, you mentioned in your opening statement that many of the access problems you, you had experienced have now been resolved, and I'm glad to hear that. However, could you please outline some of the problems you encountered prior to their resolution and explain when and how these were resolved? So our fundamental concern with the with the, 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 the discussions that we had been having with the Bureau was that it was, it was seeming to take an inordinate amount of time in negotiation and give and take between us and Quite frankly, very senior people at the Census Bureau. I mean, I, um, uh, you know, I, I heard and was uh, was taken by uh, Dr. Pruitt's comments last week that he had to spend a third of his time on on oversight issues. You know, including, you know, some of uh, some of those that uh, <laughs> that we were the source of some of those requests. That is unacceptable, and 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 we realize that. Um, and so our concern was is that routine information that was readily that we knew from 1990 was readily readily available within the Bureau was taking a lot of give and take a lot of negotiation. We had never been denied access to anything that we felt was important to get, and, and so that we always and eventually came to a resolution. And, and that's why I'm so pleased now that with the new process that the Bureau has put in place, that we will be able to routinely get the information we need with very, very li little burden on, on senior census managers out there. I, I you know, am very concerned about making sure that they don't view our data requests as, as burdensome to them. Right. No, no one wants to have the burden yes, and, and have anything to affect the census, but it, it seems like it's almost like a bureaucratic, you know, tie up all the time. Every time you or anybody wanted information that you just had to ju jump through so many hoops, eventually you got it, but why did you have to waste your time and their time when, you, as you say, the information was fairly readily, uh, readily available? And I guess now they're moving along that way. Um, sure. Since you were involved in the 1990 census, would you compare your staff and access now to the way it worked in 1990? <laughs> In, um, in 1990, we had uh, about the uh, similar levels of, of headquarters staff, about seven or eight people working full time. I'm, I'm, as I mentioned in, in introductions, I'm very, very fortunate to, um, to have my colleague Randy and, and some of his his staff be able to help out on the, the data capture aspects. Um, the, the headquarters complement was about the same this time as last time. In 1990, however, we had a much larger field structure. GAO was 35 percent larger in, in 1990 than, than we are now. Um, we had a, a um, we had in five different regions um, about two and a half people working three or four months on the census, primarily during peak operations that were responsible for looking at the implementation of the census. And we had a team in New York, team in Philadelphia, team in Austin, team in uh, or in Dallas, and a team in Kansas City and Los Angeles, where where we had staff. So it was a, a larger field presence la last time. Um, in, in terms of the the access, um, what what was the source of some of our frustration when we were negotiating? Negotiating with the Bureau is that we knew from 1990 that the information that we were asking for, and, and they weren't denying this. I don't want to, you know, imply that there was a, a difference there. But we we knew that this information was available in a in a in a, in a readily consumable form. Um, I think the. In, and we were having trouble getting equivalent levels of access that we had in 1990. Now, with the with the agreement that's been reached and the new process that's in place, we uh, we have you know much more access than we had in 1990. Um. I tell you what, I'm going to let Ms. Muller, we're going on a 10 minute roll, so let me let you take, go next and then okay. go back another round. Well, first of all, I just um, like to ask the audience and the panelists how many people received their census forms? <laughs> Pretty good. And how many mailed it back? <laughs> we got to get the response rate up here. <laughs> we know that uh, two trillion dollars over the next ten years is tied to census numbers. We know that it's very important for our building our roads, our bridges, mass transit. All of government's funding formulas are tied to these numbers. So filling it out really is important not only to yourself and your own family, but to your neighbors and to your communities that they be uh, counted in the census and counted in, in the funding formulas. But I, first of all, I would like to make sure that there is no misunderstanding. Do you currently, Mr. Min, enjoy all the access that you need? Are your questions being answered? 
Yes, ma'am. We, as I as I mentioned, we are are confident that the new process that's been put in place just within the last few days, um, because of the efforts of this subcommittee and then certainly the the Census Bureau, um, will provide us or is providing us with the access we need to meet the the oversight needs of this subcommittee. There will always be give and take, as you mentioned in your opening statement, on an operation this this large about what's available and when we get it. But the the routine operational information on how's the census going um, is now available available to us, and, uh, and I'm very pleased with that. You mentioned you were involved in the 1990 census? Uh, and in a similar role with GAO, not in the, as the Census Bureau, so I need to be careful there. I, no, at GAO? You, yes, ma'am. And what was your role then? I was, uh, I was uh, the senior evaluator responsible for our reviews of the decennial census. Could you compare the access in 1990 to the access that you have now? The access that as a result is of the, the new agreement, it's, it's much greater than we had in 1990. It's much greater than 1990. Yes, but because of this new, because of this new agreement, as I mentioned in in response to to Mr. Miller's um, question earlier, part of our frustration when we were negotiating with them was that we were asking for information that we knew was readily available, and that's what was taking so long to to get to us. Now with this new agreement, um, it's minimized the burden on the bureau, minimized the burden on us, and allowing us much greater access than we had in '90. Could could you um, elaborate on how you have greater access now than 1990? Yes, ma'am. And what, what what was it that you didn't have in 1990 that you felt like you needed? Oh, I I, I don't want to say that, that, that um, before I answer it directly. I don't want to give the impression that we that there was information in 90 that we needed that we didn't think that we were getting. Um, the bureau, with its its new procedures this time, has been uh, overly forthcoming, and I mean that in the most positive way as an auditor in in saying you know, here's not only what you're asking for, but here's some additional information which may be informative to you. Um, there been very, very helpful in making sure and working with our people to make sure that we understand um, the, the, their cost and progress system, the, that is the data that will be available, what will not be available, and why that won't be available. Um, so it's just a, been a pleasure the last few days. I, I, I also understand that you feel that the guidelines uh, for observers released by the Bureau about three months ago uh, present no problems for your auditors since GAO has established protocols for dealing with these types of issues. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. The, the, guide, the guidelines for us are, um, are not particularly relevant, and I don't mean that in, in a critical way about the guidelines, and that they, they seem to, to me to, to cut on a couple of categories. There's the um, a series of things of basic collegiality, don't expect rides from the airport show up on time, you know, which in, that, uh, um, uh, you know, as the chairman was saying last week, we would hope that anyone would do in any circumstance. Um, and then there's the, the separate set of, of, of points in there about how to conduct business, not interfering with an enumeration while it is going on. We have a, a set of professional standards that, uh, in the, the vernacular is in our yellow book, that allow us to certify that every job is done in conformance with generally accepted government auditing standards. They actually create a higher bar of professionalism and independence than, than these standards have. There has never been a, a time when we have been talking to the Bureau about the importance of a field visit that those have even come up or been referred to either by us or the Census Bureau. I mean, they're just... Um, they're not a particularly relevant document for us. But did the Bureau ever use their guidelines in any way to deny you, GAO, or anyone else um, access to information? I, I can't speak for anyone else. I know in our case that uh, we are quite confident and comfortable with the access that we've been able to get at the field level, that we are able to make the trips that we need. Um, one of the things they do ask for is generally a, a two-week uh, window before you go out there. We have in the past, for the most part, been able to give them those two weeks. I mean, there's, you know, there may be if non-response follow-up is problematic in some isolated areas and the subcommittee wants us to hurry out to some areas, those, those aspects may be tested. Um, but uh, Generally, we have not had a problem with them, no. So they're generally just pro forma organizing tools. You know, show up on time and you don't get a ride from the airport. But it's never in any way been used to deny you information that you were trying to get in your professional in, position. In the case of the GAO, we have not had a problem with those. So the main point is you've gotten all the information you've wanted. We are within the last few days as a result of the certainly the efforts of this subcommittee and the Census Bureau. I think, yes, we've come to the agreement that is going to allow us to to um, assist you in your oversight efforts. 
Mr. Mim, uh, the General Accounting Office is a nonpartisan accounting and evaluating arm of Congress, our principal watchdog of, of the executive uh, branch. Your staff is highly trained and, and is subject to professional and governmental standards. Uh, would you explain these standards to us? And uh, yes, ma'am. We, uh, um, in order to certify um, reports as being done in conformance with generally accepted government auditing standards, very similar, Mr. Chairman, to the point that you were making last week to, to Mr. Pruitt about you know generally accepted um, private sector auditing standards, there is a a whole series of requirements that we have to go through, embodied as I mentioned a moment ago in, in what we call our yellow book. At, for the very sophisticated reason that it has a yellow cover, um, and that it it lays out the, for for us as auditors and for other auditors who want to do things in conformance with with government auditing standards, the very specific practices that we need to go through. In addition, we have a set of core values that we have to adhere to that the uh, Controller General has has reinforced of accountability, integrity, reliability. We have a set of congressional protocols that I know have been shared with your offices and on on how we deal with the Hill and. And and, um, and you know how we deal with requests, and so there's a uh, um, we we have a, a, a large body of of of, uh, of requirements that we have to follow in that regard. Mm -hmm. On the substance of your of your report, Mr. Mim, uh, your testimony reflects uh, GAO's usual thoughtful job. It points out a number of what I would uh, call minor problems. Certainly, there doesn't seem to be anything which could threaten the success of the. 2000 census. The, um, the, as, I, as I mentioned at the end of my statement, the, the, the single greatest thing that has us concerned is it, of course, is fundamentally beyond the control of the, the Bureau, and that's the mail response rate. Um, if we can, in the, the Census Bureau and the efforts of the subcommittee and everyone else, um, can get that mail response rate high, then, we're, then the Bureau is in a very good shape. The, I just remind, uh, um, or I, I know I don't need to remind the subcommittee, but when we're dealing with such large numbers, even small marginal differences can have huge implications for the Census. A 1 percent difference, 1 percentage point difference in mail response rate is about 1.2 million cases. And is Director Pruitt testified a number of, I guess, a couple of hearings ago. If they're off more than two or three percentage points, um, then there's trouble. Now, that's that's one area that's beyond, that's within the bureau's, um, or not within the bureau's control. Within the bureau's control, there is the issue, of course, of the DCS 2000, which is their data capture system. I'm going to ask my my colleague Randy Height, who is the the expert on this, to to comment on that. Uh, Ms. Maloney, I would just add one point to that, and that is uh, the second pass operation for the data capture process, uh, the, the changes that need to be made to DCS 2000, those have not been made yet. So that's a development effort that still remains to be done. And as with any software development effort, you have risks associated with it. So that's, a, that's an unknown right now, and that's still an item uh, that would uh, give us some concern at this point in time. Well. Overall, would you say, when I read your testimony last night and, and heard it today, it, it seemed that everything seemed to be on target, going well, and going forward. Is that your assessment of the census to date? Um, I would. Uh I, I think in key areas, things are going well. Um, certainly, as we pointed out in the questionnaire assistance centers and Be Counted program, that seems to be working very well. They learned some appropriate lessons from the, uh, the dress rehearsal. They have some localized staffing shortage, more than some. You know, over half of their district offices or cens local census offices have not met recruiting guidelines, but they are taking actions to address that, and that's the, the important point there. As, um, as I just mentioned, though, the, the, on the other hand, there's reasons for cautions in the mail response rate if we can keep that high. And as Randy and, uh, mentioned, um, with the, the data capture system, there's still some, some real uncertainties there. Um, we are just now beginning to see the, the processing of the data, and they're, only, they're, they're not at anywhere near processing peak data. The questionnaires aren't there. It's not a fault of the system. Um, so we don't know yet how, it's, how they're actually going to go. There's a, a number of uncertainties with data processing. I don't know if you want to add some more on that. I w I'd just add that. Um we don't have data now to show that there is a problem, uh, but uh, part, part of our concern rests with the fact there's data that we haven't seen yet. Uh, not that uh, the Bureau hasn't been forthright in providing it, the data just isn't available yet in terms of the results of some of the tests that have been completed and, uh, and data associated with uh, the performance of the system, DCS 2000, during actual operations. So um, you know, part of GAO's value is turning 
you know, hearsay and innuendo and information into facts and analysis so that we can provide you the kind of uh, information you need to do the oversight that you do. And, and, and right now, we, we don't have that, uh, the, the basis for, for drawing those kinds of conclusions for you uh, at this point. I understand the chairman and that we are going to take a field trip to the data processing I hope center. We can go to one, so we can go and see firsthand for ourselves. And but, Mr. Min, you're. you're yeah, we'll come back for another just, round. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. Just could I follow yes. up with this one last right. question that relates to what we've been talking about? Your, your testimony does not mention many activities currently underway in the in the census 2000, such as the update leave, the list enumerate, the telephone questionnaire assistance, the internet response, activities in remote Alaska, and other update enumerate areas, preparations for the accuracy and coverage evaluation. All of these are currently in progress. I assume the the fact that you didn't mention these activities is that they are on schedule and going forward appropriately? Um, no, ma'am. Actually, it's, it, uh, we have not been looking at, I mean, these are very important operations, update leave and remote enumeration in Alaska. What we've been focusing on is what in the past have been the key vulnerabilities to a successful census. Um, the, the mail response rate for the vast majority, the 96 percent of the households that, uh, that have a mail out, mail back, um, the uh, um, non-response follow-up efforts, um, staffing for the non-response follow-up, processing for overall. Um, those are, if the, the, the Census Bureau is successful in those efforts, the census will be successful. If they're not successful in those efforts, then unfortunately overwhelming success in some of these other efforts, while very, very important, um, will not, not pull them through. So it's just, it's more a reflection of what are the key vulnerabilities to the census. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Mr. Ma'am, I'm glad to hear that the uh, Bureau after I think my discussion with uh, Secretary Daly and with sure. uh, the uh, Director Pruitt has brought about a new openness because there's nothing to be hidden in here. We need to have the transparency they've been saying. I'm glad that we are. I hopefully it's going to apply to both the monitoring board and our staff. And I think our staff is feeling there's more openness. And you know, hopefully this meeting will kind of resolve any concerns because you know there's no reason why you should uh, any concerns so thank you one of the concerns I was raised earlier on was when I saw these guidelines and uh, I just you know you deal with a lot of other agencies of the government can I, I can see the case especially as we go through this process all of a sudden we are hearing that in some city I won't even mention one hypothetically uh, that um, all of a sudden there's a lot of fraudulent you know filling out of forms and things going on that uh, and if you have to give two weeks notice to go visit a community um, Wait a minute, you know, I mean, you should give two weeks. You've got to plan your own flight schedules and mm -hmm. hotel rooms and things like that. Uh, but you need to have the flexibility to respond where there's a problem. If it's a problem in Jefferson Jeffersonville, that, you know, you need to be able to have that. How do you sense these guidelines compare with other guidelines with other agencies? Uh, I mean, I don't know if Arthur Anderson would have accepted these guidelines. <laughs> Well, the, the controller general, the current controller general, was a former managing partner at Arthur Anderson, so I, I'll have to be careful on how I answer that part of it. The, um, um, it in my experience, they, they are unusual for other agencies. I mean, I, I don't often, when I look at other, examine other agencies, and um, and in our discussions, I've mentioned I've, I've looked at quite a few in in, in other aspects of my work, um, see something like that. However, it's it's. The, the Census Bureau is also, as we've all been saying, a very unusual, or the census rather, is a very unusual um, undertaking in that it is so nationally diverse. They're dealing with so many temporary employees at, at various levels. And this is not to excuse or justify if, you know, something if you have concerns. It's just to say that there, there may be explanations as to why they would have it in this case that I, I don't see it in other cases. Um, an, another effort or reason that it's different in, in assessing the census is the real-time aspect. Much of GAO work is is less real-time than, than working on the decennial census. Perhaps the um, closest analogous situation could be the uh, work that we do each year um, during filing season for, for um, the Internal Revenue Service. You know, there there is an, an awful lot of, of real-time effort on that. I haven't spoken to my colleagues as to whether or not they have uh, anything similar to this, though, in, in their work. Uh, the, the Census Bureau made it out of the field ahead of schedule during the dress rehearsal. Uh, this seemed to be at the expense of accuracy since the level of proxy data was as high as 20 percent. What was the level of proxy data in 1990, and has the Bureau decided on a maximum level of such data for 2000, and what do you think are acceptable levels of proxy data? 
One of the things that's un unfortunate from the data capture operations from 1990 is that we really don't have a good number for the amount of proxy data in 1990. There was, uh, the, the Bureau did record what they called last resort data, which is their final attempt to get data, um, and presumably some of that or even a lot of that may have been proxy data, but we, you know, nobody knows, knows for sure. We do know, though, in some large urban offices, this is local census offices in 1990, upwards to 20 percent percent of the uh, non-response follow-up enumeration was done using uh, uh, proxy data. Um, unfortunately, the, the highest office, I think, in the nation was, uh, was the uh, um, Northeast Manhattan office, where 42 percent of the non-response universe was enumerated using uh, last resort and presumably proxy data last time. The Bureau's goal for, 19, or for 2000, rather, is to have 6 percent of the universe be, uh, be proxy data. And this is why it was such a concern that in in all three locations during the dress rehearsal, they were significantly outside of that uh, of that number during the, the dress rehearsal, as you mentioned in the question, 20 percent in Sacramento. Um, and so it's... Uh, why were they using such... Why did they allow such high proxy data during dress rehearsals if that's not the way they're going to do it? for the actual census? Well, it's a, it's an issue that we're still uh, talking to the Census Bureau about, um, and that is that there has not been a, a thorough evaluation, in, in our view, of the causes of this high um, usage of last resort of proxy data um, during the, the dress rehearsal. Um, as you mentioned in your question, it, it it at least was helpful in getting out of the field early in, uh, in, in the various locations or on time in the various locations. Um, the Bureau believes, though, that part of it, well, and this is, uh, well, the Bureau believes that part of it was just a, a failure at the enumerator and crew letter, le leader level, which are the enumerator and then their, their first level supervisor, to adequately follow procedures. And so what they're trying to do is, is reinforce the procedures of the importance of going through the six contacts, at least three of those must be personal visits before you do proxy data. Um, we're, you know, that, that should be helpful. We would have preferred to see a, a fuller examination, I think, of, of really what were the causes to make sure that it was just merely a lack of clarity in established procedures. Uh, as you know, the proxy, use of proxy data can affect the quality of the census we have. Yes, and so it's very important as we go through this that you have the ability, you know, if, they're, if we're using too much proxy data, we need to be aware of it. And that's one of the, you know, things we will need to find out as we approach that proxy data period, which is what, in June, I guess, is when... Yes, sir, towards the end of non-response follow-up right, is where you'll right, receive. Right. Uh, you stated that... Um, uh, with the update leave, they had fewer problems with recruiting because they could hire immediately. Yes, sir. Uh, now as we prepare for the uh, non-response follow-up, how long have some individuals sat in the applicant, applicant pool? And why is this important for hiring? Because I'm hearing, and I brought up the issue last week, is that you know, people get hired in January, but then they don't get the phone call to May, and it's... You know, there's a shelf life of those, the applicant pool. Yes, sir. How much of a problem is that? It, uh, it can be a significant pr problem or, you know, in challenge for the Bureau is that the, um, you know, they, they clearly want to have, they, they establish very ambitious recruitment goals which require a, a ramp up in order to, to meet those recruitment goals. Um, as you mentioned, and it's, you know, referring to our statement, we found in, in, in discussions with district offices or sense, local census offices where there are um, update leave operations underway, that they are the ones that are most ahead on recruitment they're the, because they're able to offer a job. It's uh, if you come and take the test and you pass the test, they would be able to say, well, they wouldn't say Chairman Miller show up on Monday to, for, to work, but they'd be able to say, you know, the, the job is available right now, um, whereas if not, to, for a non-response uh, office, they may have to wait several weeks. This, by the way, is why the, the Census Bureau, or at least part of the reason that the Census Bureau needs 9, 10, 11 applicants for every position that they get. What they find is when they begin to hire, or traditionally what they have found, is they, they burn through those list of qualified applicants very, very quickly. People will have if they were looking for a second job, will have found the job somewhere else, will have lost interest, in some cases will even have forgotten that they had applied to the Census Bureau. Um, and so that's, that's one of the reasons that they burn through very, very quickly. Let me switch to the data capture system, because I know that's something that you've been expressing concern for for uh, several uh, months now. Uh, what is your current assessment of the risk associated with developing the new two-pass system for data capture? That's right. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll Deal with the uh, second pass first. Uh, 
part of our concern there uh, deals with, with any software development efforts, you've got a cadre of core software engineers that are very intimate with the behavior of the software. And those people are invaluable, and you want those uh, individuals involved in any changes to the system, as well as uh, involved in the operations of the systems. Well, uh, the, the approach that the uh, Census Bureau was going to take for data capture operations was to have those parties available as part of technical support during data capture operations, because they are so important. But with now the move to the two-pass, concurrent with uh, first-pass data operations, we will have to be developing the second-pass software. So those uh, core uh, software engineers now are going to be diverted to the development effort for the second pass. Now, they, uh, the Census Bureau has said their primary priority is going to be supporting ongoing data capture operations. But nevertheless, you're taking uh, a, a group of uh, very important resources and you're uh, spreading them across two activities. So you're stretching your resources. So there's a resource risk there. Um, there's also, um, if you look at the schedule that's been established for the development uh, or the conduct, uh, conduct of the first pass, the, um, the testing of the second pass and the, in the initiation of the second pass, there's, uh, there, there's, there's very little tolerance for any slippage in the schedule. As soon as uh, um, second pass operations uh, conclude, then we need to be in a position, having tested the second pass, that it's ready uh, to, uh, th that we can begin second pass operations. Um, so any, uh, for example, a lower response rate uh, that could cause uh, first pass operations to be extended, then is going to have an impact on second pass uh, operations beginning uh, on time. Um, that would, th that's the primary uh, risk that I see. Uh, uh, with regard to the second pass. With the first pass operations, I don't have data now that shows me that I shouldn't have confidence in the performance of the first pass software. Um, but then again, I don't have the data that, that I need in order to have that confidence. I, I need to see the results of the uh, software integration tests or the system integration test, and we haven't seen uh, that yet. Uh, the, the first pass software was exercised as part of the Foresight OTDR, the operational test. Uh, and we haven't yet gotten the, uh, the report on the results of that test. So we need to see those, that kind of data in order to put us in a position to have confidence about the performance of the, of the two-pass software. Uh, now, that, why haven't you received that? Is there any reason there's a delay? Is that a problem? Or, I mean, well, it, there's, there's a normal period uh, that, that uh, transpires from the conclusion of a test and the development of the test report. Um, and in the case, I believe, uh, in the um, excuse me, in the uh, in, in the case of the census, it's been about a 30-day uh, period for that, and that's not unusual. Uh, and uh, uh, my understanding was that I I believe the uh, the for example the Jeffersonville OTDR report was to be available or sent to census headquarters May 6th. I don't know if there's been a delay in that. Uh, we haven't received that yet. I don't have a date off the top of my head for when the Foresight OTDR report was to be available, uh, but we expect to have that request fulfilled uh, when that report is available. The second pass data, is that the long form data? The, um, the, way, the way it works, the second pass will retrieve the long form images uh, from a um, uh, disk storage and will, from those long-form images, they will uh, present to the kefer from image keyers the, infor the, uh, the fields where there's low confidence so that those keyers can correct that number, so uh, those, uh, the, that data. So uh, it does deal with the long-form images. However, during first pass, short-form as well as long-form uh, images are optically read, and that data is forwarded to census headquarters, and it's the corrected data that occurs during the second pass that's also forwarded to headquarters, and then we'll supplant the, uh, the, the data that uh, was uh, um, forwarded to headquarters as part of the first pass. And in your, uh, you yeah, know, how comfortable are you that the optical reading, that, I mean, the whole process from A to Z, from unloading them from the trucks, opening the envelopes, processing them through, scanning them through, filing them, capturing all the data, capturing the handwritten forms, you yeah. 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 Yes. How, do, how, do you, how comfortable do you feel right now that it's going to work? Well, we'd have to break, the answer to that question, you have to break it up into each of the steps associated with processing the forms because with some items, I'm quite confident. 
the, the optical character, the optical mark recognition, I think the testing has, has proved that to be uh, within uh, uh, accepted bounds. Um, uh, with regard to uh, the, the check-in, the sorting at production levels, that depends on which uh, site we're talking about because at some sites it was tested and it was successfully tested. They demonstrated their ability at those levels. Uh, it was not successfully tested at uh, Pomona and uh, Baltimore. So uh, there would have questions. Um, the, uh, the scanning uh, of the images at production levels, uh, that's what the foresight OTDR was to give us. And again, we haven't seen the results of that, but we do understand that, we're, that was production levels put through uh, the system. There are issues about uh, the key, for Im key from image uh, productivity rates. At some OTDRs, it was, uh, for example, at Phoenix, those rates were achieved. At Pomona, for example, they were not. At the foresight OTDR, because of the nature of the forms that were used, which were basically forms with pre-printed information, all the answers being the same, you're not going to get a true read of the key from image uh, rates because it, it, it reduced the demands on key for image that, uh, uh, such that a keyer is seeing the same uh, um, uh, section of the form to correct any keying from. So uh, it's, it's variable depending on what steps in the process we're talking about. It's variable depending on what sites we're talking about. Thank you. Maloney. Okay. Through, throughout this, uh, shall we say, effort to get an accurate census, um, recruitment has been a, a tremendous um, concern given the extremely strong economy and the low unemployment rate. And in fact, the Census Bureau is still hiring, and you can call if anyone is unemployed and needs a job at 1-88-325-7733. Or you can check the, the Census Bureau's internet site at www.censusgovjobs2000. So we can try to get more people uh, informed to, to go for those jobs that, um, to, to bring this uh, recruitment level out. But you, you uh, point out that as of March 2nd, 2000, recruiting nationally is, is, is slightly ahead of schedule, that seven regions are below their goals and five are above, that 22 of 520 local census offices are, 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 experiences, uh, are experiencing severe recruitment problems. Um, is this fairly good, or is this, how does this compare to 1990, the, the recruitment levels? I think it's, it's, um, it, it's actually a good story, at, at least thus far, and we'll have to see how, how things pan out when they actually begin to hire. Um, certainly, in the number of offices that appear to be in, in the severe category, and it, which is, granted, not a term of art, um, is is smaller this time around. They're to, you know, they're varying numbers, you know, 22 in the, the Census Bureau is actually tracking kind of a bottom 50 that they look at, I understand. Um, last time, about this time, there were about uh, over 100 offices that were um, experiencing some difficulties or, get, or it appeared that would be experiencing some, some severe difficulties. I guess the, the concern, though, is and has always been that, that at a national level, you're going to do real well or, or you know, to, that you, nationally you can meet these goals and nationally both recruiting and actually hiring goals. The challenge to the census is being able to hire people across the the the, uh, the country. I mean, there is there is no other employer that has to hire people in every neighborhood in you know in the country, and um, that's the tough thing that they that they face. It's uh, they have made a strong commitment, which we completely agree with for data quality reasons, that they want to hire people to enumerate their own neighborhoods, and so it it you know extra people in one part of a town won't necessarily help them in another part of town. Um, if a crisis comes, they may apply that, but uh, um, so that's that's the challenge that they faced in 90 and they still face it in 2000. It, the Bureau takes a number of steps uh, to, address, to address local recruiting uh, problems, which you yeah. outlined in, in your testimony. Do they seem adequate to you? Yes, they seem to be taken, yeah, um, yes, I mean, they, they seem to be taking important and, in our view, an aggressive action in order to address these. And I, I should have added even this into to your earlier statement. Uh, this is one of the, or your earlier questions, this is the, one of the important differences, I think, this time between 1990. Certainly in 1990, when they had, you know, problems, they would go out and they would take actions. Um, but this time there seems to be a much more focused effort in identifying low-performing um, district offices or census offices, going in, applying either through targeted mailings, 
in some cases raising uh, uh, pay rates for enumerators. Now, that's obviously something they only want to do as a last resort, um, bringing in SWAT teams to actually help with that recruitment. Um, so there's a, there, there are a whole series of efforts that they are undertaking um, at a local level and at a regional level in order to try and address some of these staffing challenges. What we'll see over the next three weeks is whether this extra intense effort is actually going to make a difference. And, and so we'll be tracking those offices as well as the Bureau. So it seems that they have learned from the problems of the 1990s and have taken concrete steps to, to address it. And uh, can you think of anything that the Bureau should be doing that it's not doing to help in recruitment? We have, we have not had a, and as you know from our work, don't have a whole series of recommendations that are open to the Bureau on what they should be doing in the, in the recruitment area. Um, the, the only matter that we offered up was uh, for Congress's consideration was possible legislative exemptions. The Bureau, as we mentioned in my, my statement, is pursuing at least some of those dealing with welfare or, or uh, um, TANF down with, with state governments and has reported that it's been making some progress in that regard. The challenge that is, as we've said all along, the fundamental challenge that the Bureau faces in terms of uh, in, in recruitment is that the nature of the census job is, is you know, and I don't want to be... <laughs> It's not the most attractive. Um, it's uh, um, it's short-term, temporary. Obviously, it doesn't have benefits. It's very important for our nation that this work be done. Um, so it's the combination of the nature of the job and labor markets are the fundamental challenge that they confront with with staffing. Well, I uh, listened and read your report last time and actually introduced legislation to respond to it, H.R. 3581. Have you seen that? Yes, ma'am. And uh, you mentioned uh, the TANF um, problem, which uh, really Congresswoman Meeks has uh, worked very hard on in, in trying to allow current welfare recipients to receive their benefits and work for the Census Bureau. But one of the problems of dealing through a state system, some states will not take those steps. My own state has not taken that step. So federal legislation would greatly help. I know the chairman supports these efforts. This is something we could do in a bipartisan way to uh, expand the field of, of possible workers for the Census Bureau, moving uh, H.R. 3581 and uh, also allowing military personnel to, to take these jobs. So that's uh, one thing that we can do in a positive way to, to help and to respond to, to GAO. And I hope we'll be able to move that uh, this year. Do you anyway, um, Mr. Height, to, to go back to, to you on the data capture, you discussed the decision to move to a two-pass system and some of its implications. My understanding is that the decision to move to the two-pass system resulted from the key from image uh, productivity rate. It seems like a sound decision, uh, but what is your view? The, the two-pass solution is is one of three options that the uh, Census Bureau uh, considered. One of one option of which is to to do nothing, which is always an option, but was uh, unacceptable. Um, the two pass approach is is technically feasible, and uh, um, it's a it's a it's a reasonable approach. Uh, you know, the the key to any type of approach or any type of plan or solution is the implementation. Of it, and, and with any implementation, there's risks associated with it. Um, so I, I have no objection to the the approach that they've taken. Um, uh, the, you know, the key will be them to to make sure that it's implemented according to schedule and uh, according to specifications, so that it it, it functions as it is in, intended to do. Wasn't the February test a full load on the testing? The foresight. Yeah. Test. Mm -hmm. The foresight test was yes. It was uh, uh, production level uh, workloads uh, being uh, being first being scanned through the system uh, to create the digital images, um, and then for uh, those uh, the, the data to be captured through the optical uh, recognition and that data to be forwarded on to uh, uh, to headquarters. It also involved, as as I mentioned, the uh, the, fir the the changes for the first pass. Uh, software so that the uh, the images for the long forms I'm sorry the um, the um, the sample uh, data associated with the uh, long forms could be written to uh, disk 
for storage until they would be needed for the second pass. They also tested some centralized operations, the Central Coordination Center, the, uh, the technical support, the site, the uh, individual site support. So it, it, it tested a number of things, and the test is very important, and, and, and hence we, you know, we look forward to seeing the test report. Mm -hmm. But earlier um, you stated that you were uncertain about the data capture center's readiness to meet full production level workloads. Could you describe what is a full production workload? The, um, the volumes that the, uh, the uh, data capture centers expect to be able to process during peak production uh, are roughly 1.5 million forms per day. Um, and so that's the volume that they're looking at during peak production. Uh, thus far through actual operations, we're looking at somewhere around 117,000 of those uh, based on the first two days of operation. So uh, the 1.5 million are, are the production level volumes. Uh, and uh, as, as I understand it for the uh, Foresight OTDR, uh, the volumes were upwards of uh, 2 million. So they were pushing production level volumes through the system, began, beginning with the scanning process. So it didn't include the check-in and the sorting and the preparations of the forms prior to the scanning beginning. Mm -hmm. I was under the impression that, that all of the four centers were supposed to be as identical as possible. Is that correct? The centers are identical in terms of their uh, configurations. Uh, they all uh, will rely on a, cl a cluster configuration, and depending on the centers, the number of clusters vary uh, based on their expected workloads. The centers, uh, in, in, in the case of any type of operation that relies on human beings, the centers are going to be different in that the people there that are operating the system uh, are different. And in the case of some centers, uh, some forms will be processed, for, exa for example, to Jeffersonville, data capture center that aren't being processed at other forms, I'm sorry, at uh, other centers. Um, so there are, there are some differences, but uh, from a, you know, a physical configuration standpoint, yes, they are the same. Mm -hmm. But based on what you know, know today, uh, do you have any reason to believe that the data capture centers or systems will not perform as expected? Uh, no, ma'am. As I, as I mentioned, I don't have the basis to believe that they are not going to perform as expected. They, I, I need to see information for me to say that, they, that I have confidence that they will perform as expected. And I, and I haven't seen that information yet. What additional information do you need? Uh, I, w I would like to see the, um, the um, software integration test results and procedures for the first pass, the system integration test procedures uh, and results. I'd like to see the, uh, the test report for the Jeffersonville OTDR, the test report for the uh, Foresight OTDR. Would you describe that test for us? The Foresight yes. OTDR? Uh -huh. uh, this was a test of all four DCCs operating uh, in conjunction uh, with um, uh, headquarters operations in processing production load um, volumes of questionnaires. Uh, the test began with the scanning operations, uh, the, uh, the forms being fed into the scanner to, be digital, uh, to create a digital image of those forms, the, the forms to be uh, optically read for the marks and the characters and for that data to uh, then be prepared and formatted for uh, transmission to um, uh, census headquarters and confirmation of the receipt of that information. Um, it also involved the uh, number of support activities associated with the data capture operations, including uh, on-site technical support and centralized technical support, the, uh, the operational control uh, center in uh, headquarters. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. It's good to hear that you expect them to perform as expected. So, we'll Mr. Chairman. Let me ask a couple of short more questions and then uh, uh, on the two-pass system, is it, what impact does that have on the cost and the, any delay of data release? Uh, with regard to cost, there is a, um, a marginal cost associated um, with the two-pass operation. Um, we do not, we have not yet received uh, an estimate on the total cost associated with that, but I can tell you the cost number that I've seen associated with the development contractor making the changes uh, to the system. And in that case, it's, I've seen a $35.2 million uh, figure 
uh, which um, would include $10 million for the, uh, the disk storage, uh, for storing the uh, uh, digital images uh, uh, awaiting the two-pass process, and also for the, uh, the software changes associated um, uh, with the two-pass uh, approach. There's also costs associated with um, a, um, a, a tape verification backup system. Um, there, there are additional costs associated with keeping the data center oper uh, data center centers open and operating longer, but we have yet to receive a, a cost estimate on that. And the delay of the data release is that going to be impacted? Um, we have. Chris, I don't know if you want to comment on this or not, but uh, we have been told by Census that uh, it's not going to have an impact. Uh, we don't have any independent information on that. We still need to look into that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, just a, a one response to uh, Ms. Maloney's proposed bill. Um, I do support Ms. Meek's idea in allowing people on welfare to work. However, the re re yeah. Reaction we're receiving is that once we pass welfare reform in 1996 and has had a great deal of success, one of the ideas is that we allow states to make decisions. And if we start opening it up and mandating things, uh, there is real concern um, by many that uh, we're breaking that original agreement. And so that's the uh, concern we're having. So I'm glad to hear that you say that some states um, are you know, looking at the TANF requirements and such to make it possible because uh, I think it should be made possible. But you know, I understand the concerns about mandating something out of Washington. And I, in some other areas, like, you know, like working military people, I, mean, you know, I think there's real concern. We, you know, INS people and IRS people cannot work for the Census Bureau yes, for good reason. Yes, sir. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and the same way with military. So we have to be real careful about any federal, current federal employees that work with it and such. And I, um, let me ask uh, two more questions. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that there have been multiple delays in the mailing of both recruiting and teaching materials for the census and school program since early fall. What is the cause of these delays and could they have been prevented? And what do you feel the impact of the delays will be? As, as you know, I've enjoyed the opportunity uh, to go to schools and I think it's a good program, but you know, what are the delays and how, wh why? The, the, the stories of the delays is, um, is, a, is a long and complex one that we won't, you know, go okay. into for, <laughs> um, that we're, we're still trying to disentangle from the Bureau. I know, Robert, you've been That's focusing correct. on, on this quite a bit, so. Yeah, I, well, the, the, the cause of the, the delays, as, as Chris said, is unclear. I think it's something that the Bureau would like to know as, as well. We're, we're still trying to unravel it. I, uh, there, there are certain things that, that we do know. First, there were multiple actors involved. There was certainly, there was Scholastic, the, the, the company that was responsible for creating the material. There was a, another contractor which was responsible for distributing the, the material. There was a government printing office. There was the bureau itself. So there was a web of these diff different uh, actors involved that um, weren't always uh, going in, in the same direction. Um, uh, in October 1999, the uh, distributor ran out of some of the, the teacher kits, and I've probably seen them. They're very glossy, and the local partners of all, that we've spoken to have all given them, them high marks. Um, the bureau was not immediately notified. Uh, that the distributor had run out of some of uh, the, the teacher kits. Um, in the meantime, uh, in, in fall 1999, um, school at, there were some delays uh, in developing some of the materials that were used for the fall recruiting package that went out to the principals. There was, there was one um, uh, period of recruiting in the spring of 1999 when, when teachers in hard to enumerate, uh, in, in schools within hard to enumerate areas, were invited to participate in the program. Uh, but then there was uh, uh, a second mailing. Um, to principals and, and others uh, was supposed to take place in September. Well, because of the delays within Scholastic, um, that mailing did not go out until, that, um, uh, until December 1999. So um, that was the, the framework for delays. In term, in the, some of those, uh, the problem was, was cleared up. Um, uh, as of mid-December, the, the uh, distributor resumed filling orders for the teaching kits. and. Um, uh, principals and, and others uh, started to uh, get their kits uh, beginning in, in January. Now, as uh, said earlier, um, the, uh, the, the turnaround time is now two to four weeks. As to whether they will get them in time, it, it depends partly on when they, the material is, is requested. Um, we're in that two to four week time frame right now. Um, but I'll also say that the, the uh, material is available off the Bureau's website. It, it can be downloaded, although, it's, of course, it's not the same level of, of quality as you would get. And that's what um, uh, one of the um, uh, a local complete count committee did. They actually downloaded it. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, it's not 
the data is not, I mean, information is not getting out as quickly as we hope because both Mr. Maloney and I are big supporters of the Sense in School program. I know other members, Mr. Bass in New Hampshire has gone to the schools, Mr. Frelinghuysen in New Jersey has gone to schools, and I have, and I know they've been very positive received, and I think that motivates the kids to get excited about it, and then they get to go home and hopefully get their parents motivated. So let me, uh, one final question is, as you'll be back again next month as we go through this process, would you describe what type of oversight the GO has planned for the next six months? The, uh, the the next six months, and of course, I I do this all with the big caveat: it's subject to your approvals. I mean, because this is we are a, a staff agency of the Congress, and so we we work on your behalf. Um, we will be over the next several weeks. Let me start there as we peak, as we ramp up for non-response follow-up. We'll be taking full advantage of the the access to the information that the subcommittee has been so helpful in in helping us secure um, in focusing on mail response rates by local census office, looking at uh, comparing that to where they are on their recruitment efforts and trying to get a sense of is there a subset of, of census offices where we're going to have the greatest trouble in terms of meeting schedule and data quality and you know, I know Mr. Chairman you've been particularly focused on making sure that we're that we're focused on on proxy issues um, or data pro uh, proxy data. We'll also be looking very closely at the ACE. Um, we're working now with uh, through um, through your offices um, on a, a series of key operational indicators that will tell us and the uh, and, and hopefully inform the, the subcommittee on how is the ACE going while it's going on. I mean, one of the things that was a, a bit problematic last time, and that is in 1990, is that we only get a sense of, of the quality of the ACE long after um, a decision has been made to adjust, in that case, obviously, to, to not adjust census data um, after, obviously, much of the interest is, is dissipated and the public's attention quite appropriately goes on to other things. Only then did we get a, a full view of that. So we're going to be looking very closely at, uh, at operational indicators of the ACE. We fully expect that, uh, um, putting my, my colleague on the hook here, that uh, that we will continue to look very, very closely at uh, at uh, data processing operations and, and following up on, on these reports as they become available from the Census Bureau. And, in, in seeing how how they work, um, and in it, you know, I guess uh, at the largest sense, it's just being available for the subcommittee, and you know, to uh, to look into the things that can best support you in your oversight efforts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, since it's in the schools, is, is one of uh, our favorite programs. It's very very effective. I've gone to a number of schools and 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 had lesson plans with students. It's inspiring to to watch them learn about the census and their commitment of working in their own community and informing their own uh, families about the census and its importance. Weren't the delays a, a result of the decision really to reach out to 100% of the schools, not just 40% of the schools? Wasn't that one of the reasons for the delays? But I just want to make clear, clear there are no continuing problems now, are they, with uh, census in the schools? Let me deal with the, the second part and uh, and uh, ask Robert, who's been thinking about this, to, to look at the or to respond to the first. Um, our information from the people that are running the program, the Census in Schools program at the Census Bureau, is that they are still experiencing these delays in getting the kits out. Obviously, if you're looking at a four-week delay at this point, it's not going to make a lot of sense for a complete count commit or for a teacher rather to submit a request for a kit. Um, it's in the in response to these delays that some of the uh, complete count committees and, and regional census staff that we talk to have been taking action on their own, either downloading the forms off of the, the information off of the internet. Um, in the case of the, the Dade County com, uh, Complete Count Committee, um, they were, were disappointed. They said, we've basically missed the window of opportunity in Dade County um, from the, for in, in many areas for the, uh, to have census in the schools be effective. So there still is a, a bit of a delay. The Census Bureau has made very clear to us, however, that they will continue to process and any request as soon as they can, um, as long as they have kits. So there is no kind of drop dead deadline from their standpoint that if it's not in by this point, the, the, the program closes down. So, I mean, we can still hope for at least some response or some kits to be out there through uh, non response follow up. I'm sorry, Robert. Yeah, and, and as far as the, the other part of your question as to um, uh, the, the reason for what the, uh, it was the, the, the expansion of the, the program, um, that, that uh, we are still looking into that. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, want to go back to the recruitment challenge and, and really to compliment GAO, not with just coming forward with rhetoric, but with concrete proposals that we in Congress and in our communities can enact to 
increase the pool of people that can go out and be enumerators and help get the, get the count. And the chairman said this: we shouldn't interfere with the states, but the but the census is a federal program. It's a federal uh, project. It's it's not about politics. It's about people, and making sure that every person literally counts. And we have heard from GAO concrete examples of how we can have a contingency plan to help get the, the count up and to make sure that the recruitment levels are met uh, by allowing welfare recipients to have these jobs and not lose their TANF benefits by allowing uh, military personnel to uh, work for the census. These are important contingencies, and I, I feel that uh, we should uh, act on them because we know what's at stake. We know that in the last census, 8 million Americans were missed and over 4 million were counted twice. And we also know that there is a disturbing civil rights trend, that the people that are missed are overwhelmingly the poor in rural and urban areas, African Americans, Latinas, Asians, Native Americans, children. These are the people that the Census Bureau, the scientists, have told us are overwhelmingly missed. And it seems to me, uh, going back to the stated purpose of hiring from neighborhoods, that in these poor neighborhoods, uh, a very likely labor pool would be welfare recipients who could go out and uh, get job experience to help them move from welfare to permanent work, but also be part of helping their neighbors and their, and their communities um, get an accurate count, because this census is really the, the basis of virtually all demographic information that's used not only in government, but by journalists and, and uh, community leaders, educators, policymakers, um, business people when they plan where they should put their, their businesses. And uh, everyone relies on accurate census data. So I, I really, uh, although we usually agree on many things, <laughs> I really feel that we should, on a federal level, uh, act since the federal census is a federal program and so much is at stake. Uh, literally $2 trillion over the next 10 years, uh, literally dollars that are needed for schools, for emergency uh, response, for, for, for education, and uh, that we should uh, follow up on GAO's concrete proposals that they put before us on ways to assist the professionals at the uh, Census Department in reaching their recruitment levels. So that's my last uh, question, if this is the last round. If not, I'll, I have a lot more to say. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, the, um, uh, you know, we all have the same goal and objective to have the best count possible and have, in effect, no uh, differential undercount. And uh, uh, the bureaus develop a plan to really target those undercounted populations, and uh, we're, we're anxious to see how the results come. Um, we've been obviously very supportive for the total dollars spent on the census from day one, and it's going to cost us $6.8 billion. Um, my understanding that I know the Bureau has been working very closely with the welfare to work population and they made a commitment actually to hire welfare workers and they've developed a program with goodwill. And my understanding that some 37 states in the Virgin Islands have actually granted exemptions of one or more programs. So um, we're moving in the right direction and uh, um, uh, you know, I feel confident that we're going to have a good census. And so we appreciate your oversight responsibilities and we, I'm really glad to see that in the past few days there's been increased uh, uh, cooperation and transparency made available through the Census Bureau and I look forward to hearing that from both the, uh, all the other agencies involved. So thank you very much again for being here today. And thank you for your efforts on the, on the access issue, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' written opening statements be included in the record without objection. So ordered. In case there are additional questions that members may have for our witnesses, I ask unanimous consent for the record to remain open for two weeks for members to submit questions for the record and the witnesses submit written answers as soon as practicable. Without objection. So ordered. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So when do we go into a data processing? Thursday, 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 Thursday,
This weekend, Book TV presents the making of an audiobook. We'll talk to audiobook producers and visit the recording session of Senator John McCain's best-selling book, Faith of Our Fathers. The accords were signed.